Kansas, gateway to Oz. Under the rainbow, this is where it was. Hollyhocks and red ripe tomatoes, and churned homemade ice cream. Let me tell you, Kansas is more than tornadoes. It's the best part of Dorothy's dream. Today on Around Kansas, our first story is about Mary Ann Bickerdyke, also known as Mother Bickerdyke, a colorful and resourceful Civil War nurse. Next, see why you need to put the Panhandle Railroad Museum in Wellington on your list of places to visit. And then meet Johnny Western, an icon in the Western music world. We'll end with tips on how to stay cool. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego, just a short drive down the yellow brick road. It's Wednesday. I'm Frank. I'm Deb. And this is Around Kansas. Thanks for joining us. Well, you know, I don't sound like I'm from Kansas, do I, Frank? Can you understand me when I talk? I understand you, sure. Well, I, I, and I think most of the people, I hope you people understand me. Well, I've been around a lot of people that are from where you're from, so I so, can understand you. Well, I, I grew up in the South. I grew up in Virginia, North Carolina, back in the hills, so I have a hillbilly accent. But, <laughs> Frank, all these audio devices that are supposed to automatically, you know, like the voicemail, all that stuff you can do, they never work for me. And the one that is killing me lately is because I'm on the road so much, so I'm always calling 411 for directory information. Oh, my God. So the other day I call, and I needed to speak to Colby Canvas, which is a company in Colby, Kansas, okay? So I needed to speak to them about an order we had. So I call information, get the automated deal, what city and state, please? Colby, Kansas. And they said, what business? And I said, Colby, Kansas. What business, please? And I said, Colby, Kansas in Colby, Kansas. And they start giving me this automated list of all the businesses in Colby, Kansas. The veterans, you know, like the VFW Hall and just all kinds of random businesses in Colby. And I said, operator, what business is, you know, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And finally, I get a living, breathing person. I'm thinking, okay, here I am. So I'm like, Colby, Kansas, and I need the number for Colby Canvas. What business? And I said, Colby Canvas. And I tried to spell it, but she kept talking over me. You know, I would start to spell it, and she would talk over me. You know, what business? What business? I'm like, C-A-N. And I'm like, V, 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 C-A-N, V-A-S. And after two or three minutes, I mean, I could have driven there in the time it took me to explain the number that I wanted. But that one was a little, but it's every number I ask for, Frank. It's the same. I have to get a talking person because none of the automated stuff. And then it takes the real person two or three tries to figure it out. <laughs> no, I had a brother-in-law from North Carolina, and he spoke so quickly. When we were in a group, we'd say, Jim slow down so we can understand <laughs> you. <laughs> now, we did have, we had the Galax Fiddler's Convention. That's Fiddler's Convention season back home. And these guys would come down from Massachusetts. And <laughs> we couldn't, honestly, this was like people from Mars and Venus or something. You couldn't understand a word for the first hour or two. And then you started catching on. And I remember um, Hutch was one of the guys and I said, hey, Hutch, how you doing? I have no idea. And I just looked at him and I said, okay, slow down, start over. Hi, how are you? <laughs> you know the one about like, where are my khakis? Yeah. Well, you're wearing them. No, my khakis. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're wearing them. No, my khakis. You know, you turn on the khakis. Yeah, like, like Boston. That's a Boston <laughs> deal, the Boston deal. Oh, yeah. So sometimes, most of the time, Dr. Jake can understand me. But there's a few times that he's like, I, I, I don't know. What, I don't know. Oh, my. Do we have a story? I think we so. may need a translator. That's what I'm getting around to. So if we need a translator for the show, of course, we do have closed captioning. That's probably why people people don't have a problem in it hello Google, <laughs> oh, Google. <laughs> we'll be right back we got a great show
Welcome to the Jerry Thomas Gallery, where we feature my renowned artwork, frontier military, and Native American artifacts. Behind me, you see one of the paintings that are featured in the gallery. In the gallery, we not only try to feature the historical aspect, but also the artwork and the artifacts that go into the painting. Captured in the painting is some beautiful storm clouds, and the idea came from Homer Wheeler himself. He wrote in Buffalo Trails years later that a giant storm came up and the wind and hail obliterated the trail of his scattered cattle. So how I created the painting was I used the artifacts that you see here in the gallery and incorporated it to the chaps on his person and also the rope and the saddle and the tack on the horse to create the lifelike aspect of Lost Trail. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center. Your stem cells, your health, your life. I think we've got ourselves straightened out now. We're back. So, so. I want to talk about Mother Bickerdike. Have you ever heard of Mother Bickerdike? Well, she's a very famous figure that obviously you somehow missed because your education was deficient. But... <laughs> Mother Bickerdike was a Union Army nurse, so Civil War era, and beloved by the troops. She served with General Grant, and she was just a phenomenal character. That's why you should watch the show, because then you find out about people you've never heard about, oh, like sure me. Mary Ann Bickerdike, also known as Mother Bickerdike, was a hospital administrator for Union soldiers during the American Civil War. She was born in Ohio. After the outbreak of the Civil War, she joined a field hospital at Fort Donelson. She later worked on the first hospital boat. During the war, she became chief of nursing under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant and served at the Battle of Vicksburg. When his staff complained about the outspoken, insubordinate female nurse who was consistently disregarding the Army's red tape and military procedures, Union General William T. Sherman threw up his hands and exclaimed, She ranks me. I can't do a thing in the world. Bickerdike was a nurse who ran roughshod over anyone who stood in the way of her self-appointed duties. She was known affectionately to her boys, the grateful enlisted men, as Mother Bickerdike. When a surgeon questioned her authority to take some action, she replied, on the authority of Lord God Almighty, have you anything that outranks that? Mother Bickerdike became the best known, most colorful, and probably most resourceful Civil War nurse. Widowed two years before the war began, she supported herself and her two half-grown sons by practicing as a botanic physician in Galesburg, Illinois. When a young Union volunteer physician wrote home about the filthy, chaotic military hospitals at Cairo, Illinois, Galesburg citizens collected $500 worth of supplies and selected Bickerdike to deliver them. No one else would go. She stayed in Cairo as an unofficial nurse, and through her unbridled energy and dedication, she organized the hospitals and gained Grant's appreciation. Grant sanctioned her efforts, and when his army moved down the Mississippi, Bickerdike went to, setting up hospitals where they were needed. Sherman was especially fond of this volunteer nurse who followed the Western armies, and supposedly she was the only woman he would allow in his camp. By the end of the war, with the help of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, Mother Bickerdike had built 300 hospitals and aided the wounded on 19 battlefields, including the Battle of Shiloh and Sherman's March to the Sea. Mother Bickerdike was so loved by the Army that the soldiers would cheer her as they would a general when she appeared. At Sherman's request, she rode at the head of the 15th Corps in the Grand Review in Washington at the end of the war. After the war ended, she worked for the Salvation Army in San Francisco and became an attorney, helping Union veterans with legal issues. She ran a hotel in Salina, Kansas for a time. She received a special pension of $25 a month from Congress in 1886 and retired to Bunker Hill, Kansas. She died peacefully after a minor stroke. A statue of her was erected in Galesburg, and a hospital boat and a Liberty ship, the Mary Bickerdike, were named after her.
Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. There's um, a lot of different ways of doing this woodwork, but I could not make a knife without both hands, especially without this thumb. And I had, my thumb was so sore that I couldn't even touch it. And they wanted to fuse it. And I said, no, cut it off because I didn't want it sticking up. And I found out about the Kansas Regenerative stem cell and went to Manhattan and had that taken care of in my thumb. And now I'm able to go again. This segment brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. And here we are again on around Kansas. So anyway, um, you know, Kansas uh, actually has several railroads running through it or did at one time. And uh, so there are a lot of railroaders that still live mm -hmm. in Kansas. My dad worked for the railroad for uh, 45 years for Santa Fe. So the story I'm going to do is about a former um, Santa Fe railroad, railroad worker uh, who also then worked for BNSF and retired from that. And anyway, started a museum. And it's called the Panhandle uh, Museum. And it has a lot of, especially Santa Fe uh, memorabilia in it. Harvey House, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Harvey Girls. Uh, lanterns, all, all kinds of, of really interesting things. So if you're into railroads, look us up, go see it. It's, it's worth the time, it really is. This is a Kansas profile from Ron Wilson, director of the Huck Boyd National Institute for Rural Development at Kansas State University. The Santa Fe Railroad, this railroad played a significant role in Kansas history. Today, we'll meet a couple who not only have amassed a remarkable collection of Santa Fe memorabilia, they founded a museum so that others could enjoy this history. Perry and Sherry Wiley are the owners and proprietors of the Panhandle Railroad Museum in Wellington, Kansas. This museum contains a remarkable private collection of railroad memorabilia dating from the early 1900s. Perry, or P.H. Wiley as he is known, is originally from West Virginia. While stationed with the Air Force at McConnell Air Force Base near Wichita, he met and married Sherry, who was born and raised at Wellington. P.H.'s business career took them to Ohio and Kentucky before they came back to Kansas. In 1977, he joined the Santa Fe Railroad, which would later become BNSF. P.H. began as a brakeman and advanced to become an engineer. He was stationed in Wellington, which was a division point on the Santa Fe Railroad. This was a headquarters for the part of the Santa Fe known as the Panhandle Division. Wellington had a Santa Fe office building as well as a roundhouse, depot, and Harvey House for travelers. In 1992, P.H. began collecting railroad souvenirs and storing them in his basement. By the time he retired in 2004, he had amassed a large collection and wanted to share it with others. The Wileys renovated an historic stone building that had been built in 1886 in Wellington. In 2005, they opened the Panhandle Railroad Museum. This museum has an amazing collection of all things Santa Fe. For example, there are plates, pens, signs, caps, lanterns, lunch boxes, staplers, padlocks, towels, pins, pens, caps, uniforms, calendars, and much, much more. One feature attraction is a beautiful polished bell from a Santa Fe steam locomotive that was retired in 1952. Visitors are even allowed to ring the bell, which chimes a strong, pure tone. This bell traveled nearly one and a half million miles across the Midwest. The Wileys got the bell from a man in the nearby rural community of Milan. Part of the museum is the wall of clocks. Watches and clocks were vital to the safe movement of trains before the signal system was put into place. Switch locks and keys are also vital components. Display cases exhibit a remarkable diversity of railroad souvenirs, even including Santa Fe packaged foods. 
In the front room of the museum over the fireplace is a 14-foot tall painting of a Santa Fe locomotive. In front of the painting is a velocipede. Now, that's not some type of insect. It is actually a human-powered transport designed like a bicycle to travel on the railroad tracks. The velocipede preceded the use of the hand car. The museum has a large counter and safe from the local railway express office. The depot and Harvey House are no longer standing in Wellington, but the copper doors from the Harvey House are on display here. Also on display is an awesome image of the original Wellington Depot and Harvey House portrayed in wheat straw on black velvet by a couple of Kansas artists. There are caps and uniforms of the conductors, plus a uniform from what had been the Santa Fe Marching Band. At one time, the railroad had its own marching band, which traveled up and down the route for various events. That uniform might have been at the Rose Bowl, Sherry Wiley said. Outside the museum in Sellers Park is an actual steam locomotive donated to the city of Wellington in 1956. The Santa Fe Railroad. Yes, it played an important role in Kansas history. We commend P.H. and Sherry Wiley for making a difference by honoring this history and sharing it with others. It's helping to keep our appreciation of railroad history on track in Kansas. Fort Wallace stood on the frontier in the midst of the Plains Indians Wars on a major stage route and rail line. Beside the 1865 Stagecoach Station, a modern museum with thousands of artifacts tell that story, like the fossil of a 40-foot plesiosaur is suspended from the ceiling. Located on Highway 40, midway between Hayes and Colorado Springs, the Fort Wallace Museum is as welcome a sight today as the fort itself in the 1860s. Discover the fightingest fort in the West. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. This segment brought to you by Kansas Grain Sorghum, growers working together. Find out more at ksgrainsorghum.org. Johnny Western's professional career began as a young teenager, singing and playing rhythm guitar with a collegiate singing trio. He got a job on radio at the age of 13, a feat publicized in Billboard as the youngest disc jockey and singer on American radio. At age 16, Western began performing with the Sons of the Pioneers. He made his first professional recordings in the summer of 1952 in the studio of St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. After having played a supporting role in an episode of Have Gun, Will Travel, Western wrote The Ballad of Paladin as a musical thank you card to Richard Boone. This landed him a deal with Columbia Records. For 18 years, he was a fixture at Wichita's Country Station, KFDI, and for 40 years, he performed with Johnny Cash. He played guitar on 71 singles and five albums for Columbia Records. He performed in Madison Square Garden and the Great Wall of China. Hear Johnny sing The Ballad of Paladin on Have Gun, Will Travel, airing twice daily on h and I, Heroes and Icons, weekday mornings, and on MeTV weekend mornings. The classic Western features Johnny's iconic theme song, which he wrote for CBS TV on March 14, 1958. The show's 225 episodes have been seen by more than 500 million people and have never been off the air running somewhere in the world for the past 56 years. After 64 years and 4 million miles on the road, Johnny Western retired from touring at the end of 2013. He will do one or two special projects a year, as he did with the Marty Stewart Show for RFD-TV. 
Buffalo Bill Cody earned his legendary title in Oakley. Bring the family and come celebrate Oakley's pioneering history and unique geography at two sites, the Buffalo Bill Cultural Center and the Fick Fossil Museum. Cody's statue marks his achievements and welcomes visitors to the Cultural Center. The Fick Fossil Museum houses world-class fossils and artifacts. You'll find Oakley at the hub of U.S. Highways 83 and 40 and I-70. Stop for the legend. Stay for the day. Discover Oakley. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Is it hot in here or what? It is hot in here. It is hot <laughs> There's in a here. segue into a story that she's going to do. How to stay cool if you don't have air conditioning. Yeah. And I, honestly, when I moved to western Kansas, um, and Jake's like, we don't have an air conditioner. I'm like, I will die. You know, I will die. But I haven't died. And, you know, when I was a kid growing up in the mountains in Virginia, we didn't have air conditioning. And I can never remember a night we didn't need cover. Well, Not in one. western Kansas, I mean, there's always a wind. There's always so if wind. You have it, if you and, do it right. Right. And the elevation is higher. So it does cool off a lot more at night. So yeah. that does make a huge difference. I mean, our days can be blistering, as my sunburn from a few weeks ago will uh, exhibit. But um, yeah, people, I love this story because one of the things, I actually stole this from the Huffington Post, but it said, your ancestors didn't have air conditioning, and they survived. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I, I, I hate to interrupt you, but, you know, the tall grass prairie and the, and the stone house yeah. that is there, yeah. it has natural air conditioning in there because the basement had a cool water spring in there. And the way they built that and with the winds, all they had to do is open certain windows and right. a cool breeze right. that always blew through there. The Huffington Post had some ideas for keeping cool without air conditioning, and some are worthy of repeating, with AC or not. Keep your blinds closed, for lots of reasons. Hack a fan instead of turning on the AC. Not even an air conditioner can give off a faux sea breeze, but this simple trick can. Fill a mixing bowl with ice or something equally cold like an ice pack and position it at an angle in front of a large fan so that the air whips off the ice at an extra chilled, extra misty temperature. Huffington Post says it's magic. So do lots of folks in western Kansas. Swap your sheets. Cotton breathes easier and stays cooler. And as an added bonus, buy yourself a buckwheat pillow or two. Because buckwheat hulls have a naturally occurring airspace between them, they won't hold on to your body heat like conventional pillows, even when packed together inside a pillowcase. Set your ceiling fans to rotate counterclockwise. Whether you know it or not, your ceiling fan needs to be adjusted seasonally. Set counterclockwise in the summer at a higher speed. The fan's airflow will create a wind chill breeze effect that will make you and your guest feel cooler. Focus on the temperature in your body, not the house. If your ancestors survived without air conditioning, so can you. From sipping tasty ice drinks to applying a cold cloth to a strong pulse area like your neck and wrist, cooling yourself from the inside out is not a bad idea. Other tricks include being smart about your clothing choices and telling your partner you won't be cuddling until the leaves start changing color. Turn on your exhaust fans, again, for lots of reasons. Heat proof your bed. Go straight to the source and put a cool inducing chillo under your head while you sleep. For feet, fill a hot water bottle and put it in the freezer before placing it at the foot of your bed. And it sounds strange, but slightly dampening your sheets before bedtime will majorly help you chill out. Let the night air in. During the summer months, temperatures may drop during the night. If this is the case where you live, make the most of these refreshing hours by cracking the windows before you go to bed. You can even create a wind tunnel by strategically setting up your fans to force the perfect cross breeze. Just be sure to close the windows and the blinds before things get too hot in the morning. Ditch the incandescent lights and start grilling. Even if you weren't lucky enough to be born cool, you can be cool. 
Uh, we have to go. I'm Frank. I'm Deb. And we'll see you somewhere around, around Kansas. Kansas. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Homemade ice cream. Let me tell you, Kansas is more than tornadoes. We're the best part of Dorothy's dream. We're the best part of Dorothy's dream. To see this show and past episodes of Ag AM in Kansas, go online to agamincansas.com.